I want you to turn to Romans chapter number 15. Romans chapter number 15. And Keaton, if you could this morning, could you give me just a little monitor, please? Not for anybody else's sake, but for my own so I can hear myself this morning. I appreciate it. How many is ready for the word this morning? The rest of you will pray for you right now. How many is ready for the word this morning? Amen. I pray that you are. I'm going to ask you to stand if you're able for the reading of the word. Romans chapter number 15. We're just going to dive in this morning. I have a whole lot of things to say, but I'm only going to say what the Holy Spirit will release me to say this morning. We'll see how far we get today because I'm going to try to give you a series in, a, in just a few moments because this is something that's very near to my heart this morning. I want to read with you the first five verses of Romans chapter number 15, beginning in verse number one. It says, we then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Tell your neighbor, it's not about you. Now you just offended somebody. How in the world are we going to go any further? <laughs> Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. Wow. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scripture might have hope. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one towards another according to Christ Jesus. Let us visit number four again. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scripture might have hope. I want to take a few moments today. And I want to talk to you about the triumphant church. However, I want to deal with a call to focus. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you this morning. I thank you for the presence in this room. I thank you for the precious people in this room. And Lord, I thank you for those that are joining us by way of technology today. Lord, I pray that over the next few moments we would have ears to hear, hearts to receive today what you would have for us. Lord, I pray that there would just be a spirit of encouragement in this room today that would come. Lord, I pray if there's one here that is overwhelmed, Lord, that there's one that's just in a place where it feels like they just don't know if they can continue. Lord, I believe you want to speak to them today. Lord, I thank you for it. But Lord, today I pray, Lord, that you would be exalted and lifted high in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord this morning. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of Scripture might have hope. One could say the definition for hope is to look forward with desire or reasonable confidence, but it's also something much deeper than that, and we will get into that in just a few moments. I read a quote recently, and it said, Thank you, Lord, for giving me strength when I'm weary, hope when I'm disappointed, and peace when I'm anxious. I am grateful for the strength that he grants to us. Anybody grateful for the strength that he grants us? As well as I'm grateful for the peace that is given. How many is thankful for the peace that passes all understanding? But even greater especially as we have now lived for a little while, and especially when we get into the seasons of life that many of us are in in this room now, when we can look around us and we're getting into a place where it's almost like we've said goodbye to just as many that we still have around us. I'm grateful for the hope that we have in him this morning. Paul simply said, if this is all there is, then we're just men most miserable. But how many knows that this isn't all there is? And I know that when we get into Thanksgiving and Christmas and we, we have this flood of emotions because of life that we all have been through, but this morning I want us to 
be called back to a place of focus today because I know this, that we are not just serving a God of strength and a God of peace, but we are serving a God of hope this morning. And there's a songwriter that said it so beautifully, and I can't add to it or take from it, so I'll just share it with you. It says, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. But one of the verses is this, perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending bring from above echoes of mercy and whispers of love. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Can I tell you today, there's still a reason to praise him. There's still a reason to rejoice this morning. Today in a world that is filled with violence and hatred and pride and gross darkness on every corner and around every turn. And along with that, a spirit of weariness that seems to be smothering a generation. It is easy to become distracted and lose sight of the hope that we have in Jesus. In this moment of time, we need to pause and remember the finished work of Calvary. Can I tell you today that in Colossians chapter number 2 and verses number 14, and we are told very clearly that it was nailed to the cross, meaning this, it was finished. For it was at Calvary that you and I today have received a release of the strongholds of sin. And we have been given a hope that allows us to be able to rejoice. We who had no hope now have been granted mercy and peace and rest. We find that in this passage of scripture that we read together, Romans chapter number 15. When you read through this entire chapter, there is one emphasis that is given to you and I as believers. And that is this. We are called to be like-minded. He didn't call us to be alike. Thank you, Jesus, because you don't want to be me. And I sure don't want to be you. But he did call us to be like-minded. What does that mean? It means that we are to be men and women that are focused, men and women that understand that we are to be different uh, than those of the world. How many knows that there's all kinds of things pulling at us and our minds can be in a million places, uh, but God is calling us to a place through the writings of Rome and says you need to be like-minded. You need to be like-minded like Christ is. Notice this, his mind was to fulfill the will of the Father. You and I today have to understand uh, we are commissioned and called to fulfill the will of our Father. And it is amazing when you and I begin to understand when we look through history the power and the ability that is present when men and women walk in a state of like-mindedness. But you and I cannot walk in a place uh, where we are like-minded unless we are men and women that are focusing and understanding the hope that we have in Christ. Uh, We find that at the time Tower of Babel, uh, there was such a commotion that was going on that it caught the attention of heaven, uh, and that God Himself said, "I have to go down and take a look at this and see what's going on." Uh, and when He got down there, notice what He said: uh, "There is nothing that is able to stop them from accomplishing uh, what they have set out to do." Uh, he said, "I have to bring confusion to them." What He was saying is this: uh, There's a group of people that are like-minded, uh, and they are going to accomplish what they have set out to do. That's why the enemy wants you to be so distracted. Uh, That's why the enemy wants you to be in so many different directions uh, because he knows this. If you get like-minded with your brother and sister in the faith uh, and you get like-minded in alliance with the Word of God, uh, there is nothing that is able to keep you from accomplishing uh, what you have been commissioned to do. Uh, But I find throughout the Scripture that there is multiple places uh, where I can see something absolutely transpires uh, when men 
and women become like-minded. Uh, there was 400 outcast men uh, that was in a cave uh, with David. Uh, the world said they have no value. They have no purpose. They are rejects of society. Uh, but David looked at them and said, I think I'll just let you all get in like-mindedness with me. Uh, and they become mighty men of valor. Uh, and they began to bring uh, victory uh, in that season. Uh, I could talk to you this morning and preach for a while uh, on a man by the name of Gideon uh, that was threshing wheat in behind the wine press. Uh, and the Lord says uh, that you are a mighty man of valor. He said, what do you mean? Uh, and he simply goes down and gives him some men, but he says, that's too many. Uh, oh, that's still too many. Uh, and with a handful of men that got like-minded with Gideon, uh, they began to defeat their adversary. Uh, I could also talk to you or preach for a while this morning uh, after the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, as he was getting ready to ascend to heaven, uh, he simply said to the 500 that was out by the seashore that watched him go, uh, simply said, you need to go to Jerusalem and tarry there because not many days from now uh, you will be endued with power from on high to be witnesses uh, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. Uh, we don't know what happened to everybody, but we do know this. Uh, about 10 days later, there was 120 in an upper room, uh, and they was in one mind and one accord. They was like-minded. Uh, and when they was, there was a power and an anointing of the Holy Ghost uh, that came. And they are the ones that it says a little bit over in the book of Acts that these are they that turned the world upside down. Yeah. You say, well, I don't know if I have 120. Well, you don't need 120. You just need one. The Bible says where two or three are gathered together in my name uh, that I am present as well. How can I validate that statement this morning? Uh, Paul and Silas, uh, they was doing what God had commissioned them and do, to do and called them to do. Uh, and after hearing somebody walk behind them, uh, after being grieved in his spirit, Paul simply says, uh, come out of her, you unclean spirit. Uh, and we find that it brought hardship upon him and Silas. They was beaten. Uh, they was placed in a prison cell. Uh, but around midnight, they began to sing uh, and they began to pray. They got in like-mindedness uh, and all of a sudden there was an anointing uh, that caused uh, the foundation of the prison to shake and every door opened uh, in the prison. Uh, what are you talking about, preacher? Uh, I could go on and talk to you about Jonathan and his armor bearer. Uh, his armor bearer said this, Jonathan, uh, I don't have any weapons. Uh, I don't have anything in my hands. Uh, all I know is that I'm going to carry what belongs to you but I don't have anything to fight with uh, but you do whatever's in your heart to do because I'm with you uh, and we find that they went out and they began uh, to cause a disruption in the garrison of the Philistine uh, because they got into a place of like mindedness uh, I'm here to tell somebody this morning uh, we've got to get back to a place uh, where we understand it's not about me uh, and it's not necessarily about you uh, but it is about you and I coming together uh, for the things that God has called us to be and to do in this season. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and preach for a moment if that's all right. Uh, because can I tell you, uh, we are in a world right now that does not have hope. Uh, it doesn't have joy. Uh, it doesn't have peace. Uh, and I understand that the world shouldn't have hope and joy and peace. Uh, because without God, you don't have any of those things. Uh, but what disturbs me is when I see people uh, that are blood-bought, spirit-filled, uh, walking around with their head hung down. Uh, baby, I'm telling you, get your head up. Uh, we still got a reason to have joy and peace and rest uh, because he is still our hope this morning. Hear me today. It's a call to focus. Paul is writing in Romans chapter 15. He says, listen, uh, the things that was written aforetime was written for our learning, meaning this, we are to become educated that God moved then. That means he'll move now. Has he ever healed anybody in this room? Has he ever came to your rescue? He hasn't changed, friend. But we are teaching a society just to exist. But can I tell you, there is things more than the present. I could be disturbed this morning. I, my spirit is heavy this morning for many things. But at the same time, I look beyond what I see in the natural and realize that this isn't all there is. But at Calvary, 
That which the blood of goats and bulls could not accomplish was accomplished by a spotless lamb by the name of Jesus. If you read a little further in Romans chapter number 15, beginning in verse number 8, it says, Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, for this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles and sing unto thy name. And again he saith, Rejoice, ye Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all ye Gentiles, uh, and cover him, all ye people. And again, Isaiah saith, There shall be a root of Jesse, and he shall rise to reign over the Gentiles. In him shall the Gentiles trust. Talking about you and I. But then verse 13, Now the God of hope, Fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Can I tell you this morning, it's not going to end like you think it's going to end. That lying devil that has bent your ear that said, oh, it's not going to be. Can I tell you? They can do whatever they want to to this physical body, but you cannot destroy the man inside that's going to live for all eternity. Uh, this is just a temporal house. Uh, I'm just living here for a very short season, uh, but I will live for all eternity. Uh, I've shared this often uh, in memorial services, uh, but Billy Graham, uh, he was interviewed, and he said this, one day you will hear uh, that Billy Graham is dead dead. Uh, but he said, don't you dare believe it for a moment. Uh, because when you hear that, uh, know this, rest assured uh, that Billy Graham will be more alive than he's ever been. Uh, can I tell you, uh, I have hope this morning. Uh, I'm not getting ready to die, uh, but I'm getting ready to live uh, in a brand new body uh, with joy unspeakable uh, and full of glory. But we walk in and we walk out and we say, well, I just don't know if I'm going to make it. Listen, it is God's desire for you and I to abound in hope. I have a blessed hope this morning. My hope is not based on what men will do or decisions they'll make. My hope is that the word of God is the absolute authority. Billy Graham also said this. There came a day in his life he found himself out in the woods after his dear friend had recounted the gospel and the message that he had preached and traveled with him many, many miles. And after he was been ridiculed, he took this Bible and he laid it on the stump in the woods and said, Lord, I've come to a place where I don't understand it all, but I'm going to believe it all. And what he was simply saying is, I'm putting myself in a place where I'm like-minded with your word, and I'm going to put all of my hope, all of my trust in this. I will stand here and tell you today, there's some things in this book I don't understand because I have yet to get revelation. Uh, but at the same time, I keep going back knowing this is the word of God. Uh, and I know that by the power and the anointing of the Holy Ghost, uh, in due season, uh, there will be times that I will get revelation of some things that I don't currently know. Uh, and when I do, I will proclaim it on the rooftops and say uh, that God is still God. Uh, can I tell you, uh, I am not a um, one that's without hope this morning uh, but I gotta call you back to a place of focus and tell you this is still the infallible word of God uh, and it is still forever settled uh, and we after the world has passed away uh, his word will remain so I have to ask you what are you building your life on if you're building your life on this your life will remain but if you're building your life on anything else it is going to evaporate into a place of destruction very quickly. Yes. You and I today find ourselves in a culture that has been overran by demonic activity. Please hear me. Paul relays to us, it is God's desire for us just not to have hope, but to be filled with hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Hear me. One may ask, what is hope? I can give you a brief 
definition, it is the belief or the trust that God will accomplish everything that he said he would do. And that's why I do what I do today. Because his word says, hear me. We must unify on his word. James chapter 4, verse number 14 says, Whereas you know not what shall be of tomorrow. Can anybody tell me what's going to happen tomorrow? You may have plans for tomorrow, but you have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow. You have no idea. Yesterday I got news of a gentleman that I know, our past at Cross with an organization that I'm part of, the Harvest Foundation, and we, uh, he was a minister of the Cleveland Assembly Church of God, been with them for many years, vibrant, full of life, given his life for ministry. Him and his wife currently, is, they, they serve in Cleveland, Tennessee, and, but him and his wife has been on a ministry trip in South Africa and unexpectedly just dropped dead this week. Now his wife trying to get him home from South Africa. I don't understand all of those things. Working hard, serving, giving himself to the God. I don't, I don't have an answer for that this morning other than this. God knows what he's doing. Hear me. I, I, I need you to understand with me that God will accomplish. And you and I need to understand we don't know what tomorrow brings. He had plans. He had a schedule. He was still trying to fulfill. But listen, his tomorrow was different than what he had planned the day before. And therefore, for what is your life? James goes on to write, what is your life? Then he answers his own question. It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanishes away. I've been messed up a little bit the last few weeks because I have went down memory lane. God has really taken me on a journey. Taken me and I've listened to and I'm not a big TV guy at all, but every evening I've went in and I've found myself staying up later than I normally stay and listening to some documentaries of men and women that have given everything. I, I, I've revisited the life of Polycarp. I've relived the li- uh, revisited the life of White Clift and, and many others, Corey Teen Moon and all of these people you hear me mention from time to time. I understand that there was a weight that got upon them in such a manner. And I began over the last month, this weight of getting the gospel has become so heavy in my life, heavier than it's ever been. But then I ran across certain songs that has began to just minister to my heart very deeply. There's some lyrics in a song that I recently listened to over the last few days, and it simply says, I'll paraphrase it in this manner. If today's the day that you come for me, have I done everything that I could have done for you? Did I please you? Did my life really accomplish what you set out for me to accomplish? Or have I become so distracted doing everything else That's why Paul is writing. He says, listen, I need you to be like-minded. I need you to have the mind of Christ. But also I need you to understand that he wants you to abound in hope. Meaning this, if you're abounding in hope, you're going to be consumed with this thing called the commission of where I've got to get one more. Last Sunday, Times Square Church that was founded and built by Pastor David Wilkerson, great man of God that's in heaven now. It's under great leadership even today and has had great leadership. But Pastor Tim, in their 10 o'clock service, it was disrupted by a moving of the Holy Spirit. And he said this in his following service, and I shared the message that he preached. Everybody should listen to it. It's on my social media page. I don't share things like that often, but, but it's a wonderful message that was preached in Times Square Church last Sunday. I encourage you to listen to it. But in their 10 o'clock service, hear me, you may ask, why is it we're supposed to live such a life of focus, a life of like-mindedness? Is because, and why do we need to abound uh, in the hope 
uh, by the Holy Spirit is because the Holy Spirit came in and disrupted the service. And all of a sudden, Pastor Tim said, I was on the front row, and he said, all of a sudden I felt the Lord said, I'm interrupting this service. And I know this gets close to people in this room, and it gets close to my heart. But he said, something, the unction of the Holy Spirit said, I'm disrupting this service because, he said, there's people in here that if I don't disrupt this service and if you don't yield to my leading, he said, they're not going to make it through the weekend. He said, there was such a heaviness and there was such an alertness of a, of a spirit of suicide. And he said, I was like, okay, God, I'll obey you. And he said, I thought in my mind, okay, there may be one, possibly two people in this room. So he said, I, he got up in that service and he said, if you feel like you're not going to make it through, the enemy's telling you, you don't need to make it through this weekend. He said, I'm going to ask you to come to the front of this building. And he said, there was at least 30 people that came and stood in the front of the building. Listen, those people are in the house of the God week after week after week, but the enemy saying you can't make it, you can't make it, and therefore there's no joy, there's no peace. Listen, you and I got to get back to where we're living a life of focus. None of us is exempt from those oppressing spirits telling us it's not worth it. But hear me today. God wants you and I to abound in hope. Paul in his writing continues, and I'm hurrying this morning. He continues and he says, listen, you got to be like-minded because notice these things was written aforetime for your learning that through patience and the comfort of the scripture, you might have hope. I want to ask this question, and maybe this is a little personal, but I feel like I need to ask you this morning. Is there a lack of comfort and peace in your life? You don't have to answer openly, but answer that in your mind. Is there a lack of comfort? Is there a lack of peace and rest in your mind? And you say, yeah, preacher, there, there, there's, there's some troubling things going on. Let me ask this question. How much time did you spend in the Word this week? Notice what Paul is saying. He says that through patience and through the comfort of the Scriptures. This Scripture... Listen, you'll sit down at the natural table and eat, but if you're going to live, you've got to sit down at the spiritual table and you've got to eat his word and it will bring comfort and peace and hope into your life. And you and I today, if we're not careful, we're allowing the world to keep us so busy. But may I remind you today of the words of Jesus himself in John chapter number 6. Verse 53 through 58, for the sake of time, I won't read all of it, but let me jump through it. It says, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you shall have no life in you. If you don't put this in you, there's no life in you. But notice verse 58 says, this is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead, but he that eateth of this bread shall live forever. Listen, you can abound in hope this morning. But you got to first be comforted by the scripture. You got to be encouraged by the scripture. Notice it goes on in John chapter 12, 25 says, He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto eternal life. What are we consumed with? What are we focused on this morning? We must pause and remember that we have not just been given life here, but we have been given life for all eternity through Jesus Christ our Lord. Not only have we received life, but we have given a promise for our future. One of the most amazing and powerful verses that we find in Scripture is this. One of the things that brings us most hope in John chapter number 14. Most of you could probably quote these few verses. Let not your heart be troubled. See what happens when you begin to read Scripture? It begins to bring a comfort. The first thing God is saying is, I, don't, don't be troubled by what you hear, what you see, what you're experiencing. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, and if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. And I will receive you unto myself, that where I am you may be also. 
See, our future is so much brighter than our past. I say that often. But I think sometimes we fail to grasp what that really entails. I'm not talking about just a fresh move of God, not just a, a, an explosion in the spiritual realm here on earth, but I'm talking about for eternity, our future is bright. Because the one that laid down his life as a lamb been led to slaughter is no longer viewed in that manner any longer. But he now is viewed as the lion of the tribe of Judah. Please hear me. John caught a glimpse of your future. I'm not talking about anybody else's future, but I'm talking about your future. He caught a glimpse of your future. If you can honestly say this morning that I am saved, that I've given my life to the Lord. Notice what he said. He said, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth in Revelations chapter 21. He said, for the first heaven and the first earth was passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and he will be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Anybody in here ever cried? Think about it. He'll wipe away all tears from your eyes. And there shall be no more death. Every one of us has had to deal with the sting of death. But there's no death in our future. Neither sorrow. Anybody dealt with disappointment? Frustration? Listen, no sorrow. Nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain. Anybody got any pain in your body this morning? Guess what? You can abound in hope right now knowing this. That thing's only temporal. Can I take you back to James chapter 4? Life is just a vapor. If it's just a vapor, that means that pain that's been driving you crazy for the last week or the last month. Guess what? It's, it's, it's getting ready to be gone. You all don't believe what I'm telling you this morning. I can tell. Listen. I'm going to rejoice that there's a day coming very soon. I'm not going to wake up with an ache and a pain in my body. Listen, you want to see this big guy getting out of that little Toyota Corolla. Used to, I just jumped right in and out of it. Now, no more. I got to roll in it and roll out of it. Listen, my mind tells me, and I've looked at a few online. I was like, yeah, I think I need to buy that Corvette. But then I realized, Rodney, I can't even get in it because I, I'm too old. I can't even slide down in there and slide back out. So I guess I'm going to have to buy another Jeep or something, you know, something I can step up in and sit there and lay down in because this body's just all different now, right? But it's only for a vapor. I'm full of hope because, listen, I'm going to have no problem mounting that white horse in heaven. You all just ain't got it this morning. You say, I don't want to ride a horse. Well, I'm sorry. You're going to ride one. It's going to be beautiful too. Notice, no more pain for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, behold, I make all things new. Listen, all things new. There's some things that you wish was new right now, but they're not new. But they will be new in the future. Notice with me. And he said unto me, write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. I will be his God and he shall be my son. Hallelujah. Hear me this morning. It's time for you and I to become focused. It's time for you and I to become men and women that are abounding with hope this morning. How do we do that? It's by getting back to a place uh, where we go back and we visit. Uh, while it's detrimental for us to live in the past, it is very beneficial for us to visit it. Uh, and when we go to the scripture, we visit the power and the anointing and the faithfulness of God throughout generations. Can I tell you, uh, the God that delivered Daniel from the lion's den is the God that's able to deliver you from your den of lions even today. So I'm going to abound in the hope that the finished work of Calvary is not something that has been done away with or ignored, but it's something that's still just as powerful and real today, this morning. 
in a world that's out of control, there is one that's sitting in the throne room of heaven that says, I still can move and change everything with the movement of one finger. The song we used to sing in children's church, maybe we should begin to sing in the sanctuary. He's got the whole world in his hand. Why are you so troubled this morning? Why have you allowed the enemy to take your peace and your joy and your rest? Why is it that you think that what the enemy's telling you is true, that you're not going to make it, that you're not going to get through? Can I tell you, we will overcome. We must get our focus right, however. There is things that... If I had my way, they would work out differently. But I don't know his ultimate plan. But I know this, I must trust in him. I must believe in him. And I know this, that this isn't all there is. So I think if I could sum this up this morning, as they make their way back to the keyboard today, I think we have to come back to where we become a people that are eternally focused and not earthly focused. I want, oh, how I want there to be a manifestation of the sovereignty of God in the lives of every man, every woman, and every situation. If I had my way, I would desire for every person I ever prayed for to be miraculously healed and their situation be completely turned. But sometimes throughout the years, I've learned that God's greatest act of kindness and mercy was answering prayers differently than how I prayed them. And that's hard for us to understand sometimes. But after a few years under my belt today, I can stand here and tell you I'm thankful that God hasn't answered every prayer the way I thought he should have answered them. I'm glad that there's a few times when I said, Lord, do this, do that, that he simply just said no. Because now when I look back, it was for... It was for the good. There's a call to focus today. I see a world that's upside down. I I see children going through so many difficult things. I see Young adults, middle-aged adults struggling in so many areas that I, just a few years ago, never even crossed our minds. I've had conversations with people and dealt with issues that I never dreamed that I would have to deal with. I've saw sin in its ugliest form. I've breathed in the smell of death in so many forms. I've cried with families that I've loved. And I've cried with strangers that I didn't know. I've had people look at me and say, Preacher, why? And I, I, I don't have the answer that they want me to have. But we got to become the people that are like-minded and realize that there's an eternal aspect of this thing. One of the most dangerous things that's going on right now in the world is not done by politicians. 
It's not done by evil men, but it's done by those of us that's in the house of God this morning. And shame on us as spiritual leaders. We have removed the focus off of eternity and put it on the now. And we have created a generation that thinks now is the most important. Please hear me, young man, young woman. This isn't all there is. But I will tell you this morning... While death will come to this body, you will never really die. But you will live for eternity. And I know this isn't popular this morning, but can I tell you, there is only two destinations. A place in the presence of God that has been bought and paid for through the shed blood of Jesus at a place called Calvary. But if we choose to ignore and refuse his love, then there's a place called hell. Brother Ken, it's hard for me to sleep when I see all that's going on in our world. And I see a church that doesn't talk about eternity. But we got to abound in hope. My father, as he was taking his last breath, he wasn't focused too much about here. He didn't want to say goodbye to us. No. But while he was still here, he was still a He was abounding in the hope of heaven. I mean, he didn't have just a little sliver of hope, but no, he was abounding. As he was taking his final breaths here, he's he's looking at a photo of my mom and said, we're going to walk together. Been waiting for a while, but we're getting ready to take that walk. He was abounding in hope. Now, in my own selfishness, I'm like, oh, God, if I could have just kept him a little longer. But I got to realize, man, he's more alive now. Oh, can I tell you this morning? We could walk and get in the car and we can go to Dale Cemetery and I can show you where we laid his, his body. And right there, him and mama, I said, that's where they're at. And the natural says that's where they're at, but my spirit says that's not where they're at. Ah, but I'm abounding in hope, Brother John, that there is a day coming. Paul said this to the church at Thecklenica, and obviously understood that somebody was going through the process of losing loved ones. And he said, listen, I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them that are asleep. But there is a day coming where the trump of God is going to sound. Listen, I know we're getting ready to go into Thanksgiving. There's going to be people missing at the Thanksgiving table. But can I tell you, you got to abound in hope. Because we that are alive will not hinder them that are asleep in the Lord. But with a mighty shout of the archangel and the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first. There is a day that they're going to come and they're going to re-enter and they're going to receive a glorified body. And yes, sir, they're going to come out of the grave. But today, can I tell you, they're not there. To be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. I'm abounding in that hope. What am I doing? I'm trying to build your faith before you leave this morning to tell you that this thing isn't over when the last breath is taken here. It's just beginning. And throughout all eternity, I get to sit down with those that I love, those that I never met. And I'm going to be able to go through the ages. But I have to abound in hope this morning. Maybe you walked in here, you're discouraged, you're overwhelmed with the things of life. Can I tell you, this life is just a vapor. 
But if you hear nothing else that this preacher says this morning, hear this. God loves you. Oh, how he loves you. He loves you so much that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would call upon his name that they would be saved. Meaning this, that then they are positioned and brought back to a place where they can abound in the hope of eternity. I will not be separated from my loved ones. I will not be separated from the one that has gave it all for me. But throughout eternity. I said all of that this morning just to say this. There is only one organization on this planet that is really able to be triumphant. And that is the church. You and I today can rest in knowing that God is still who he says he is. And as we go into Thanksgiving, I want you to be thankful today. I want you to be thankful for your salvation. Thankful for your healing. Thank you for your deliverance. Thankful for your family. Thank you for the blessings. I want you to be thankful that this isn't all there is. But by the comfort of the Scripture, by the power of the Holy Ghost, you can abound this morning in hope. You know what that means? It means to be filled with. This morning, I'm filled with hope. Even though I go through some stuff, even though I've experienced some things, I'm filled with hope this morning. Because I've read His Word. I've read the back of the book. I know how it ends. But I also know that living in the latter moments of the last days, I know the prophetic promises that's been spoken. And I know that we're on the verge of experiencing something supernatural that the world is not expecting. I need you to hear me this morning. This isn't hype. This isn't to get you to give me an attaboy. But I'm, I want you to hear the word of the Lord this morning. There is prodigals that's getting ready to come home. There is miracles that's getting ready to take place that cannot be explained. There is a moving of the power of the Holy Ghost that's getting ready to shake this nation and the nations of the world. You and I need to begin to abound in hope. The glory of this latter house is going to be greater than that of the former. What does that mean? What does that look like? We can't even comprehend what God's getting ready to do. But I need you to be like-minded. I'm not asking you to understand it all. I'm just asking you to believe it all. I'm not asking you to come to an intellectual end. I'm asking you to come to a place where you just believe that God said it. I believe it. And I'm going to embrace it. As we stand all over the house this morning. An old songwriter simply wrote these words, I have hope that there's a land that's better. I have hope that there's soul lives on. I have hope. I'm going to ask you just a simple question this morning. Do you have hope? Do you really, really have hope this morning? We're in a season where such a spirit of weariness is in so many places. But when you get back to the Word of God and you begin to see what His Word says concerning you and concerning your family, listen, I, I just keep going back and I just, I just keep sitting in His presence and saying, God, I don't know how you're going to do it, but your word says you're going to do it. So, Lord, I have hope. I don't understand it all. And I see everything that's going on. And, and I said, Lord, I, I, you know, and you grandparents will understand. I'm still new at this thing, but, man, I'm loving it. But I look at my grandchildren. I'm like, man, I, I don't know how you're going to do it, but, Lord, I'm. I'm abounding in hope that you're going to keep them. 
I speak over Jackson nearly every day. Lord, I don't know how, but Lord, you're going to keep him. And he's going to be a mighty man of God. He's going to touch his generation. I speak it every day. I speak it over that little baby girl. Man, I held her last night. She loves me, and I love her. Had to go to Ohio, but it's worth the drive to Ohio. I'll go to Ohio. I don't care. She just sat and looks at you. And I said, Lord, I don't know how. Lord, I'm abounding in hope that she's going to be a mighty woman of God. How can I do that? Is because his word says, train up a child in the way that it go. When he's old, he will not depart from it. See, there's comfort in the scripture. I refuse to give any place to the enemy in my family at this stage. And not just my grandchildren, not just my children, but the Lord has prompted me, and I pray that you hear this this morning. When you look at your family, you look at your siblings, you look at your nieces, your nephew, don't settle for what you see presently, but know this, God has better for them. He has more for them. And you began to believe God for it on their behalf. Let me remind you of this, and then we're going to pray. There is a place that humanity can get where they can't help themselves But that does not mean that they still don't need to be brought into the presence of Jesus. You read of the story in in the New Testament where there was a man that was bored by four. And they came and they tore the roof off and they lowered him down in the presence of Jesus. He did not have the capability to get into the presence of the Lord on his own. You need to understand this morning that the enemy has entangled lives of people that you love and they're not able to get to where he is on their own right now. And I don't need you to be weary concerning them. I need you to abound in hope concerning them and say by faith, I'm going to carry them one more time and if I have to, I'll take the roof off this thing because I'm going to get them into the presence of the Lord. Your Bible says that he is faithful to those that call on his name. we got to get back to calling on his name and faith believing. This morning. Do you have it? Hey everyone, it's Pastor J. Davis here. I want to thank you for watching today. Please feel free to like and subscribe or find us on our other social media platforms. And we pray God's blessings your way. You have a great day. We'll see you next time.